Thank you, Mr. Reves. There are uh, three questions that the committee asks of every nominee, so I'm going to ask each of you to respond uh, briefly just with a, with a yes or no, and we'll start with you, Mr. Shriver, and then Mr. Reves. First, uh, is there anything you are aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office to which you have been nominated? No, Mr. Chairman. No, Mr. Chairman. Second, uh, do you know of anything personal or otherwise that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you have been nominated? No, Mr. Chairman. No, Mr. Chairman. And lastly, do you agree without reservation to comply with any request or summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of Congress if you are confirmed? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Great. Well, thank you. Mr. Revez, um, on, uh, on his first day in office, President uh, Biden issued a memorandum entitled Modernizing Regulatory Review, directing the production of recommendations to improve and to modernize uh, the regulatory review process. My question for you is if confirmed, what will be the first concrete steps that you will take to finalize the actions required in this memorandum? And what do you believe are the most important reforms that should be made at OMB Circular A4 to help modernize the regulatory review process uh, in the federal government? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a strong believer in evidence-based decision-making. Uh, Circular A4, which provides guidance to agencies on how to conduct their cost-benefit analyses, is a very important document, but is now almost 20 years old. As the President called for in his memorandum on modernizing regulatory review, Circular A4 should be updated to account for advances in scientific and economic understanding in how the costs and benefits of regulation um, affect the American people and are distributed across populations. If confirmed, my first step will be to receive an update from staff on the progress that has been made thus far and see what needs to be done to move forward with the President's command. Thank you, Mr. Rivez. Uh, Mr. Shriver, uh, federal retirees have, have been reaching out to my office uh, a great deal uh, to express an incredible amount of frustration uh, with uh, the length of time that it takes the OPM to process uh, their retirement uh, claims. As Deputy Director, if confirmed as Deputy Director, how, how are you going to work to reduce these retirement uh, claim delays including uh, modernizing OPM's legacy retirement systems, and that means transitioning from a paper-based system and Excel sheet calculators to really an updated platform and updated tools that can expedite this process. If you could give us your views on that and how you plan to tackle that challenge, I'd appreciate it. Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and let me just start by saying that we do need to do better by our federal retirees. These are folks who commit their careers to federal service, and when it comes time to retire, um, they need to be getting top-notch customer service. I know, um, though I don't oversee retirement services in my current role as the Associate Director of Employee Services, I do know that the team works hard day in and day out to serve those retirees. I think you're right in that the systems do need some modernization. I know there have been past efforts over many years and across many administrations to modernize the retirement system. So obviously there are some challenges there that I look forward to being briefed on. I would, uh, if I were lucky enough to be confirmed, I would be uh, excited uh, to bring to bear my experience in operations and customer service that I gained in the healthcare space. And certainly, as Deputy Director, I would prioritize improving customer service for our retirees. So given your experience in customer service and the work that you did prior, give me some sense of how you believe we can improve the customer experience uh, for federal employees and retirees, both uh, current employees as well, uh, that rely on the OPM for their benefits and services? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. And certainly OPM is uh, rebuilding capacity. Um, as Ranking Member Langford laid out uh, in his opening statement, the OPM has been through 
um, turbulent several years, and so we are, we are certainly rebuilding the capacity of the agency and looking at our customer service um, capabilities. I think one of the things that I can say just from my experience in my current role is it's really important to build good relationships with the agencies, not only with the chief human capital officers, but with other parts of the agencies that maybe work in certain policy areas or work um, on, on benefits, for example. A lot of the challenges that happen with respect to retirement processing have to do with the way that information um, it transfers between agencies uh, and OPM, uh, in particular, if somebody has worked in multiple agencies or under multiple retirement systems. Uh, but with respect to customer service writ large, um, agencies rely on OPM um, in any number of ways to have approvals for uh, expedited hiring authority when there's a critical hiring need or special pay authority. And we've been working really hard to build those relationships with agencies and be proactive and help them problem solve so that OPM can reestablish itself as the strategic human capital leader for the federal government. Right. Mr. Uh, we held a hearing earlier this year in the committee to, uh, on the need to improve uh, the customer experience uh, for citizens uh, as they interact uh, with government. And we heard how the Paperwork Reduction Act and the Privacy Act can create uh, some significant hurdles to delivering high quality citizen services to the American people. Um, in, in addition, uh, this committee recently passed uh, uh, the Disaster Assistance Simplification Act, which basically exempts large portions of the PRA and the Privacy Act to ensure that disaster survivors can easily and quickly receive benefits uh, they deserve. Uh, likely a lot of folks in Florida are going to be interacting with the system after the hurricane just swept through, as an example. And folks, uh, often in a very difficult time in their life, uh, have to wade through a variety of paperwork and different paperwork for different agencies to try to get help that they desperately need. So my question for you is, do you agree that the PRA and Privacy Act could be updated to take advantage of modern customer experience, information technology, and, and data sharing developments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the PRA has important goals. It seeks to ensure that government information requests generate useful information and not impose excessive burdens on the American people. Information should also be collected in ways that make it useful across the federal government, for example, by using consistent protocols. The PRA dates back to 1995. It is now more than 25 years old, and, and amendments might well be appropriate. If confirmed, I look forward to working um, with members of this committee and their staffs and, um, and, and learning more about um, what experience of stakeholders under the PRA has been uh, during the period since the statute's passage. But I, I, I do agree that figuring out how best to respond to the needs of the American people through the PRA is an extremely important goal. Well, I appreciate that. There's a lot of work to do in that area, and with breaking through some of the bureaucratic hurdles, should uh, I would hope would be a priority for you uh, if you're confirmed. Will it be a priority? It, it will be a priority, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you.